Okay, let's get started. I Last time I was covering matrix algebra, I didn't entirely get through that. However, I think this time I'm going to chapter 8, sections 1, 2, and 3. Th th these notes are actually for sections 1, 2, and 3 in chapter 8. And if I have time at the end, I'm going to go back to matrix algebra. Um, notice that I have given the final assignment which most of the problems in Chapter 5, I think there's, a, there's one from Chapter 4 and there's maybe two from Chapter 8. So I think there are about eight problems. These are, again, these short answer type problems that came, were similar to your first assignment for these, mainly Chapter 5, but some 8, some 4 and some 8. Um, the question arose as to what all, what all did I want. Um, In other words, if you do a R command build, you're going to end up with um, you're going to end up with a corresponding file and potentially PDF output. And for example, that will not include the help files I was in, as I understand it. So you probably should put the help files in sort of a packet you send to me. And um, so again, if you step down through it in terms of how you do the help files. Uh, the oneway.rd, for example. Um, and step four is creating, using save, they create a coagulation.rdf, and then you're going to create a help file for it. And then, again, we're going to build a package using our command build from originally that .r file that you had in assignment two. And, and then illustrate illustrate the uh, help. Now in principle this should help. Um, that would mean I would have to, if, if you didn't give me the help files, I would actually have to execute completely your pack, install and execute it, which maybe is okay. Um, and then um, you illustrate it. I did, um, I did change the due date on this slightly. to tomorrow, but if you're a little late, I'm not going to worry about it too much since I'm so late getting back. I have done quite a bit of grading, but I haven't turned them back yet for the for the second and third assignments, which I'm doing together. So they, they will be forthcoming. Um, so my here's my plan. For, we have three lectures left. Um, chapter 8, sections 1, 2, and 3 we're going to do today. I may go back and do a little matrix algebra. And in terms of the topics left, there are two topics left basically in chapter eight. Once is, one is a little bit of um, a little bit of work on databases. There are built-in databases in R, or there are interfaces to other databases. And so, part of it will be uh, I'm probably going to look at databases a little bit, and then the other technology that we'll look at is XML files and how you manage those. Uh, databases and XML are both very important formats that you need to be able to extract data from and do things. And in particular, the Bioconductor project uh, involves both of those. And so um, we'll get in a little bit of that today. But that's sort of what we'll do uh, next time. I'll do some of that work. I will be leaving sometime on the 9th, which is next Monday, a week from today, um, to do review and talk about the final what I'm expecting from you for the final. Okay. The final is not until the 17th, which is near the end of finals week. So I don't know if that's good or bad. If you were planning on leaving Morgantown early, it's bad. It's also 7 to 9 p.m. on the 17th. So. So it gives you more time to study, I suppose, but at a bit of a price. So are there any questions? Now, in principle, I should be able to install your package and run it. I don't know what happens if I try to install. Of course, if I try to install and it doesn't install, then I have to kind of look at it. So you might want to give me some other materials like the PDF files or the help files or something. If it actually installs, then you wouldn't need to do that because I could actually 
get the help directly. But then I have to keep uninstalling your files because I install one, then I have to uninstall it. So we'll see. So if in doubt about, if in doubt, you might want to include some supplemental files like the PDS if you're not sure that your code is completely going to work. That way I'll know you've done it. But I can also look at your, I can also look at your code and, you know, how you constructed those to get some idea of whether or not you did it correctly. Any questions? Is it possible you can put up the due day of the homework? Because we have yeah, these are, too many exams. I'm, I'm saying these dates, but I will, ex I will accept them a bit late. I'll accept this one anytime this week, and I'll accept this one anytime next week. Okay. Up into the weekend. But probably not beyond that. Okay. So I'll, I say 12-3, which is sort of midnight tomorrow, but I'm, I'll accept this a bit later in the week if you're having difficulty. Or if you have exams. Coming up. I'm not sure how dead week is defined. <laughs> it's not, it's no longer just a week now. It's is it like from this Wednesday to next Wednesday? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> not sure how it's defined. At any rate, what I'd like to do now is to go in and so I'll leave that up in case we have a question that comes back. So let's go into our studio. And so I will... So I'm going to look at this file, which you can download. OK, chapter 8 is data technologies. There are a bunch of online databases um, that if you're working in the area of bioinformatics, you need to get familiar with. And they, these online databases could actually be relational databases, or they could be web-based, uh, for example, XML-based databases. Um, so what do, we've already done part of what you might say is data technologies. When I did section, when I did chapter 9.8 from that other book, you know, when I was doing something like casting and melding and those kind of things, reshaping. That was all from another book doing part of what is covered here. But um, what is covered here is a little too brief, particularly for the topics that I covered in 9.8 from the other book. So the question is, is when you get it, when you get data, uh, remember the wheat example, I think it was a wheat example I did where the data was in a terrible format and you had to go through regular expressions and all kinds of things to get it into a form that you could actually use to analyze um, that was kind of an extreme case, but um, it's, it's not unfair to say that you actually will spend perhaps more time doing data management than you will data analysis. And that's because the data is often not in the format that you need it in to do the statistical analysis. So we need to know how to process and transform data, interface to databases, interfaces to data sources in XML, and I've, I've mentioned those. And also, of course, use, and if you're doing bioinformatics, you need to know what the bioinformatic sources are of data uh, using web, various web protocols. So that's what we're going to do. And one of the things that, um, one of the things we'll be looking at is GO, which stands for Gene Oncology. And this is actually a vocabulary of terms, biological terms, organized into what's called a directed acyclic graph. And 
Go has uh, three components to it, the molecular function, the biological process, and the cellular component. And so um, if you want to be able to extract that data and deal with it, then, uh, and a lot of this data is actually metadata, then uh, you, know how, you have to know how to process and know how certain interfaces in R to these types of data sources. There's, a, um, there's another project going on that actually maps genes into Go terms. And then there's what, what are called evidence codes, which explain why a gene is mapped into a particular term. So if you're mapping a particular gene into a Go term, then the question is, is why, why did you do it? And I'll look at an example a little bit later on. So we often, we often transform one or more input data sets into an output data set that we need to actually do the analysis. You may have data sources you have to merge, and we talked about merge in that 9.8. That was one of the operations we did. But there are other operations. You may have sorting. I think we did sorting and so forth. We, had, we would take what I called wide format, which is common for repeated measures, and we converted it to long format. Uh, that's a very, very common problem that, that you have to do, or go from long to wide. And so all of those we've already done. We're going to do a little bit more of that today. So I'm going to be working with a data set that may be at least partially deprecated called the, it's, it's the Human Genome 95 AV2. It's a meta package for the human genome. And this is actually a little bit out of date. And if you actually run it, I think you'll be told that at some point it's deprecated and will be done away with. Um, and the reason is, is this metadata, some of these metadata environments that we have, they're converting to databases. So this is not a database, but they're converting a lot of these files, text files, into databases so that the way you extract data is going to change. Now we'll look at some of that in section four. So, um, so this actually um, this actually deals uh, the particular examples we're going to be doing with a lot today are from affometric mi microarrays. If you look at microarrays, what happens is you get gene expression data. So you want to know which genes are expressing data, and usually it's under different experimental conditions. So, for example. Um, you may have a particular gene that you think is associated with breast cancer, such as BRAC1, and you'd like to know how, what the difference in expression is between, say, a control group of patients and, and a group of patients that have uh, cancer. So at any rate, um, so what we're going to do is, uh, we first of all, uh, for alphametrics, you have these probes that, that actually have, are associated with particular genes, and you put them in, and you sort of see the reaction with that probe or, or the expression. And so you'd like to know, you'd like to identify, you'd like to extract um, information about which chromosome each probe is located on, for example. So you have different probes associated with certain locations on chromosomes. And so the first thing we'll do is we're going to run this library. Now I should mention that if you actually if you actually knit this, you'll see that this package is actually deprecated. And that means at some point it's going to disappear. And the reason it's deprecated is that it says that you should consider start using this particular version of it. The dot .db means database. What they're doing is going through and taking some of these textual files and putting them in a database. And that's partly because the text information became so big that they needed to store it in a database. So the file we're using is being replaced by a, a, a particular file in a database. Oh, it's actually a package. And so that's sort of like the current package, except that it's associated with a database. OK. Now, what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to take, if I look, notice this term. It's, it's, 
got the same terminology, HDU 95AB2, but then it's got CHR, and that CHR uh, is the chromosome identification. The CHR stands for chromosome. And so what I'm going to do is change, I'm going to take this particular file. In other words, HDU 95AB2 is actually a package. And within that package is, is this particular data structure. Um, and what we're going to do is coerce it. Um, we're going to coerce it to a list and then unlist it. That seems strange, but you actually get a vector-like structure with name components. You actually get a structure that's of type character of CHR. So let's let's do this. Um, and so if I look at the particular structure, and I'm only looking at the first 10 or so, um, so what you have is the particular, the particular chromosome, and then you have the actual probe name. And if I look at, if I do a table of the of chromosome vector, you can see that chromosome one, chromosome one has 1,164 probes. Notice all together there are 12,000. 640 probes. And so if I add up all these numbers on the bottom row, they add up to 12,460. Uh, chromosome 10 has 437 and so forth. So this tells me how many probes. And more or less, each probe is associated with a certain gene. I say more or less because that's not quite true. So you can see that there are 22 Notice that it goes one, t it's, it's sorting, it goes, instead of one, two, three, it goes one, 10, 11, up to 20, 21, 20, and then it goes three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Those are the chromosomes, and then X, Y are the sex chromosomes. You notice that Y has far fewer probes and it has far fewer genes than the, than the X chromosome. So um, if I look at the class, it's of class character. And let's suppose I look at the first 10 names. Um, in other words, if I, these are the actual names associated. The first 10 out of this 12,640, these are the first 10. These are the probe names. OK, so this is the type of thing that you have to do to manipulate biological data. Now, um, we might want to know, we're going to do a split. So what, what we're trying to illustrate is some of the operations. We're trying to illustrate some of the operations here, um, like split. We're going, uh, we're looking at the, we created this thing called character vector. And we're going to we're going to look at the names, and we're going to split it by um, by the different character vectors. So let's take a look and see what this is. So let's look at the structure, and here we can see these are the chromosomes, and so what we have are the names for each chromosome. Now this is only, in other words, this 1,164 for chromosome one. Uh, that's just the first few names associated with it. So therefore, we could get the probe names by chromosome. And if I wanted to find the length of this, I could use S apply. Now, if you remember from S apply, there's an L apply that takes a list and applies a function to each component of the list. S apply does one more step. It's like L apply, except it tries to simplify it into either a vector or maybe a matrix. So in this case, what does it do? Well, it gives me, it just gives me that count again, because I'm just using the function I'm using as length. So that's just giving me these lengths, which I had already computed up here. It's the same thing, just a different way of doing it. In other words, I broke it apart. This is a list. Notice the dollar sign here. You can also notice down here that in R, 
you can actually see the at you can see this information in R uh, if you look at the global environment. So I'm looking at the global workspace, and so you can see that this is um, <clears throat> that gives me some of the same information I had up here. So in other words, this is a um, by character is a list, and each component of the list is actually a chromosome. And each chromo so um, each chromosome has associated with it all the probe names. So that illustrated a that illustrated um, some information. What about chromosome Y? Now notice I have the double brackets. By chromosome, suppose I go in and I'm finding this one that says Y. So if I wanted all of those, I could simply run that, and that gives me all the probes for chromosome Y. Again, as I said, probes more or less course each probe corresponds more or less to a gene, and we're going to sort of see that correspondence in a bit. You see, if you buy, and epimetrics is fairly expensive, although it may have gotten cheaper, but there are different microarray techniques that you can use uh, to get gene expression data. And you're running a gene, what you're doing is maybe testing 5,000 or 12,000 genes at a time. So you, you order these chips, and they target certain genes. And, of course, they get it kind of expensive at least for the affometrics get expensive. And so, um, you know, you're going to pick, you're going to pick, if you pick 5,000 genes, you're looking at a lot of possible genes. You're more or less doing a screening experiment to see which genes might be associated with a certain type of disease, if the disease is genetically based. Okay. So, okay. Well, as a brief interlude, uh, I'm not going to go over this section on the apply functions because we already did that in, in that section 9.8 from that other book. We did we did the apply, the L apply, the S apply, and I think you you probably use T apply on your one of your homework problems to do the one way. Uh, T apply applies to it gets applied to vectors of unequal length, whereas you know if you're doing some of the other apply functions, they have to be of the same length. By is sort of like it's, a by, it's sort of like the by statement in SAS, but it, it's like T apply. Um, now, one of the ones that we make that we're actually going to use here is E apply, which applies to environments. And then there are some others like M apply, where you have multiple values. And then there's an interesting thing called R apply, and that means recursive apply. Suppose you have a list, and inside list you have a, a list has components, right? Well, components can be list. And if you have a component that's a list, that component can be a list that has, you know, in other words, you can, you can have list within list within list. You end up with a tree, a tree structure. And so if you want to search the whole tree, you have to sort of go down it if you want to do an exhaustive search. There are efficient ways of doing it. But the point is, you can, if you have a tree structure and you want to apply a function to every node of that tree, the tree is sort of branching, keeps branching down. You have a root node, and it keeps branching from the root node. Uh, a lot of times, you know, in machine learning and uh, statistical learning and data mining, you have what are called decision trees. And so um, a lot of times you have continuous variables, but you actually break your decision on a discrete point. Uh, and so you make it from continuous, you make it into discrete breaks as to where the breaks are for your prediction. Uh, function. Um, so if you want to do exhaustively search, you could use the R apply, which is recursive, when you have a tree-like structure. Uh, and then the ES apply, you may remember I talked about expression sets. Expression sets is an underlying data structure in Bioconductor. And so you can actually use the apply, you can actually use the apply, uh, a specifically designed one for expression sets. So, so the idea is that um, there's another data structure. In this package, 
HGU95AV2, there's another data structure called um, HGU95AV2 map. And that's a map between the alphametric identifier and the chromosome band. So, you know, if you know chromosomes, there, there are two arms to the chromosome, which in this book they're calling the P and the Q. Some people would call it the long and the short arm. Um, so at any rate, uh, chromosomes, it's sort of like an X, and they sort of have this, um, there's a center point where they meet, centronome, yeah, uh, where they meet. And, um, and there are two arms that emanate from that. And so if you're lo trying to locate something, you have to know which arm is it, it's on, and you have to know which chromosome it's on. So, um, so this map gives you a mapping uh, between the alphametric identifiers and the chromosome band location. Um, so, so for example, um, if if you have a probe one thousand one underscore at, and you'd like to know what it maps to, and say a particular gene tie one, then um, well, that's the type of thing that we'll take a look at. So, I'm not sure that does it here, though. I think I think this is the same. Yeah, this is the same library we've already done. So, if I look at the structure of this, this is not particularly helpful. Uh, but this is the internal structure of this map. Um, you know that it has probe IDs, gene ID, and so forth. Um, as sort of embedded information in it. Notice the dollar sign, so it's a list type structure. Um, and then if I extract, if I extract this particular probe ID, so I could run that, if I extract it, then this says that's on chromosome one on the P arm. And then there's a band from 34 to 33. Um, So again, that notation, the 1 means chromosome 1, the P means on the P arm. And then the location 34 on, along that chromosome arm. OK, so, um, so suppose you want to, now, now we learn regular expressions for a reason. So if you think you can forget it, there are two reasons you don't want to. One is you need it, and the other reason it will be on the final. So a couple of reasons why you might want to go back and review the regular expression. So here we have a simple one. Suppose you'd like to search for all, suppose you'd like to search for all the genes that map to the P on the chromosome 17. Now you know from the notation that we've looked at that you first of all have you first of all have the chromosome name, and then you have the arm, which is either a P or a Q. And so uh, I'm going to search. Do you remember what the caret means? The caret means you start in the first position. And I'm going to search for a 17 followed by a P. So I'm going to do a grep. And so I'm going to map that function over this mapping function. So my position, my position, I'm going to do a, I'm going to do an e apply, which is I have a mapping environment, and I'm going to have a function which is really a grep function, which searches for all sequences starting with a 17p, which means I'm searching for everything on chromosome 17 on the p arm within that map. And I'm using E apply. And that's because this is actually defined as an environment, this data structure. Now once, um, you know, once they change it to a database environment, this isn't going to work. You have to use something different. But for now, it does. Um, and what I'm going to do is unlist it. That, that returns, that re, the eApply returns a list, and I'm going to unlist it, and then I'm going to look at it. So what we get, 
what we get on the top, we get the probe name, and below it, you get the position. Notice they all start with 17 feet. They all start with 17 feet, and then they have the location. Okay. So this is the loca this is the location of all the probes on the chromosome that that on chromosome 17 on the PR. So if I look at the length of this, we can see there are 175. So I have I have 175 probes that correspond to the P arm of chromosome 17. Now you may you may say, well, that's quite a few, you know, but you have to understand is that most Affymetrix chip may have five or ten thousand probes. So this is how many occurred on chromosome 17, the P arm. This is actually a home, this is actually a, I don't know if I assigned this or not, I can't remember, but it's, but you can play, if I did assign it, then the only thing you have to do is play with it. I can't remember if I assigned that as one of the probes or not. This is a general thing that actually, um, if you look at the key thing in here, it's, it's got this E apply, it's got this grepping function, but this tells you what you want to search for, um, and the, the PPC is actually a homework problem you may have done earlier, which puts a carrot in front of uh, the which. So which, uh, which, which is, you're passing in which uh, the chromosome you want followed by a P or a Q. So it might be 6Q, meaning chromosome 6, the Q on. And then that next function was a little function that was a homework problem that just puts a caret in front of it, which means the first position. So this is a general thing. It, it, it first of all gives you a mapping environment. Could be any mapping environment. We happen to use the human genome. But suppose you wanted to do the dog genome. So you could use the mapping function corresponding to the dog genome. And you could then search for certain sort of if you did probes, experiments on dogs, then um, you could do the same thing as the experiments we're doing here on humans. Okay, so that's a general function that from a given map that maps affymetrics to particular chromosome locations, um, the which tells you what you want to pull out. Okay. Now, you can take a look at this. There are some built-in functions. They apply at functions are actually more efficient than looping constructs. You have four, if you do four looping, it's slow in R. The apply functions are faster, but they're not as fast as they might be. So it, it turns out that if you have a matrix and you wanted either the column means or the column sums, or you wanted the row means or the row sums, there are some built-in functions for doing that. Also, in the bio base, there are some built-in functions. Now, these are faster than the apply functions, and the apply functions are faster than looping constructs. However, one thing you have to remember about the apply functions, particularly L apply, is that people parallelize it, and it's often quite easy to parallelize L apply. So that you apply it, and you're mapping over these components of a list, and you do it in parallel. So if you have eight pro processor cores, you can be doing eight at once, instead of one at a time. So any questions? Um, I didn't, uh, we're sort of moving here, and I'll, I'll move back to some things that are more biological in a moment, but the reshape function, do you remember when we did um, melt MELT and cast, and going from long, from wide to long and long to wide? Uh, you can actually do this, there's a reshape function that also lets you do it. I, I, I didn't put examples in that, but I am going to look at a simple example that you will use a lot. And so I'd like to, just using what's called C bind, which means column bind and row bind. So I'm going to create a, I'm going to create two matrices here. And so if I actually look at X, it looks like this, and if I look at Y, it looks like this. So I created two matrices. I said, okay, the first matrix is one to six. 
the number of columns is two, and then the dimension names is a list with the rows are the letters and small letters, one to three, and the columns are the capital letters, one to two. So for X, we get this. So one, two, three, remember it goes by columns by default. Uh, and now Y goes from 21 to 26. Again, it's gonna be two columns and the dimension names are the letters six to eight, which is F, G, H, and C and D for, in caps for the column headings. So these are two, my two matrices. Now what happens if I C bind them, meaning column bind, I bind by columns. Notice what happens is I now get the A, B, C, D joining together, but notice that it uses the names for A, B, C. I'm not using the, F, I, I can't have two names for the same row. So it's using the first one, which is a, B, small A, B, C, not small F, G, H. Okay. So there I combine, you know, if I've got sets of variables, you often use C bind to, com to jo join variables together into a matrix, let's say. Uh, if I do a row bind, notice that I now have the ABC FGH, but I lost the C, capital C, capital D. And again, it uses the first one and counted. So there I'm combining them by row. So those are two operations, particularly the column bind is used a lot. I have variables and I bind, I have different variables and I bind them together into a matrix to do certain fitting linear models or whatever. Okay, any questions? Now, another operation that's fairly useful, suppose I have a list that's named, the components are named. So I have a named list. So here I have S1, let's take a look at S1. So S1 has three components and the components are named, A, B, and C. And A has one, two, three, B is 12, 13, and C is the letters of the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F. What would happen if I stack S1? So I'm using something called stack. What happened? Oh, let me print it out now. Now notice what happens. Um, remember I had one, two, three that were associated with A. So I actually get two variables here. I get two variables. And let's take a look at the class of SS. It's a data frame. So I created the values, the values are given as one column, and then my identification are, are using the, the names of the components. So A corresponded to 1, 2, 3, and so they, it, for, it forms like a factor, where the fact you can think of the names of the components as being the levels of the factor and then BB and NC and so forth. So that stack is often quite useful. Okay. okay, so what I'd like to conclude in this third section, what I'd like to conclude in this third section is getting back to this mapping stuff. And I'd like to take I'd like to take this file, this map. This is this is a particular data structure within the package uh, HGU 95AB2. This is a data structure called map, and I'm going to convert it to a list. So I say as list. So I'm going to do map P. I'm going to make it into a list. And you actually can sort of see it down here. Here's map P. And so this gives a mapping. This gives a mapping for, um, this gives a corresponding mapping for, um, let's, let's look at some, let's look at the first one. Okay, so that's, the probe name is 1000 underscore AT, and this corresponds to the location, which is 
chromosome 16 OMP ban 11, or part of ban 11. Okay, so this is giving a mapping between the affymetrix probe and a location on the chromosome. Okay, so that's what map P is, and I originally, I mean, that's what map is, but I converted it to a list, which is a data structure that might be, it might be useful for, <clears throat> it might be useful, for example, if I'm applying a, a function and I need to apply it to a list, such as E apply. So if I take, what I'm going to do, I look at this inner part right here. I'm going to find out the length. I'm going to find out the length of each of these components. So this probe, I'm going to look and sort of see how many times each occurs, and then I'm going to unlist it. So let's do M lens. Okay, now in lens, I'm applying, I'm getting the length of each of these, and then what I'd like to do is, that would be long, I don't want to do it. What I want to do is convert that into a table and then look at the table. And you could see, if you look in the book, you'll see a different answer. And that's because this database has been updated since the book was written. There's actually, um, there's actually, um, it turns out that there are certain regions where the mapping maps to more than one chromosome location. And so there are 40 of them that map to two chromosome locations. And that could be due to a couple regions. That's sort of uncertainty on actually what certain genes are. But it's also there are certain regions where I think these are restricted to maybe the XY chromosomes that have certain things in common. And so um, even though you might think they don't. Um, so there are 40 of those that have two locations. In the book, there was a single chromosome. Uh, if you actually look in the book, and you're looking for the M, this, if I try to run this, you're going to find out, well, there aren't any threes. But um, um, at one point, you see, it, it's, actually, it's actually an integer of length zero, because there aren't any threes. There are ones and twos. And, but, the, but in the book, there was actually one three. And what this code does, it's blacked out. It actually found the name of a gene corresponding to the three locations. So, um, and so that is what this code is, but I blacked it out because that code no longer works since there are no, there, there are no locations that occur in three chromosomes. No, no probes associated with three chromosome locations. Okay. Okay. Now, what I want to do here, um, I'm going to look at the ones. I'm going to look at the M lens equals two. I'm, notice the equal equal sign. Now, in other words, I'm I'm saying I'm doing. I've got brackets, and I'm going to subset M lens for just the forty, I believe, that are two. So M, M lens equals two. There are forty of those, right? And so M lens equals true is going to be a true or a false. It'll be true for 40 and it'll be false for all the rest. And all the rest is where most of them are. If you recall, there were 12,585 uh, that would be false and there would be 40 that would be true. Uh, and I want, to get, I want to get the names of these. And so I'm going to execute that. So I'm getting the names corresponding to this. Um, so if I do... If I look at lens two, um, lens two, uh, here, here are actually uh, the names corresponding to it. These are the probe names corresponding. Now, what I want to do now um, is this is another data structure within that package. So I have a package HGU95AV2, and there's a package called uh, uh, intras ID. Now the intras is a database, and I'm going to mget. I'm going to get from this database everything corresponding to the probes in Lin2, and then I'm going to unlist it. So before I do that, let's take a look and see what this database is. So I'm going to go back here, and I'm going to search for this database and see if I, see what I find. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, here, 
so here's the database. Uh, th this is sort of one of the National Cancer Data, NCBI, National Can Center for Biotechnology Information. And so if I go here, <clears throat> then this will give me information on specific genes, for example. So for example, uh, if you wanted to look up something on the BRCA1 gene, I could go here. The BRCA1 gene is a key gene in breast cancer. And so this says it's this stand BRCA1, BRCA1 stands for breast cancer, BRCA1, early onset. If you test, if you test positive in a certain way for that gene, you might genetically be predisposed to breast cancer. So where is this gene? This gene is on chromosome 17 on the Q arm in position 21. So you can see by going to this database, you get information about particular genes. Now, we're not the only ones that have a BRCA1. So for example, here's the house mouse has a BRCA1. Notice it's in small letters here, but it's um, <clears throat> the location there is a little bit different because of our gene structure. But uh, in other words, um, this is giving BRCA1 genes, house mouse, uh, the Norway rat, and so forth. So there are a lot of Brock ones. This is for a dog. Um, that doesn't mean they're exactly like our Brock ones, but genetically they may be quite similar. So at any rate, this is this database that we're actually searching from. This mapping is a mapping from the probes in FMetrix to this database. So this mapping data, this mapping, this this particular file uh, called th this is this is the package, and then this is the data structure that gives the mapping. Whoops, that was not smart. I hope I can undo that. Uh, let's see. What I did was. Unfortunately, I'm running this on the server, and so I can't do certain operations that you can do. On the, I think this is correct. We'll find out shortly. Um, HDU 95AV2 on. I think that's right. Okay. So, uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get. I'm going to do a search for everything, all the probes in this, that map them to the corresponding information in this entrez. That database. So I'm going to run this, and uh, that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted that was just the mins too. I wanted to run this. Okay, and now I'm going to remove duplicates. This says if it is not duplicated. Uh, so I want to remove duplicates, and then I want to look. I want to look at the corresponding values here from Andres, and so. These are the, the first number on the top is, are the probes, and then what's below it are the, are, are the corresponding code for entrez. Let's see if we can find this. Brock 1. So, for, so Brock 1 is, no, that's not what I wanted. But this gives even more information. Um, I was trying to look for the number. Let me go back a minute. Someplace they have the ID numbers that corresponding to this. It might be this number. So they, in other words, there's an ID, there's an ID number that identifies it uniquely within their database, and that's what we're finding. And then once you find that number, you can find the actual gene. So, um, so those are, that's the actual number in the database that corresponds to a particular gene that you could then find. Is that clear? No, maybe not. But um, now, lens two, I can also remove. Um, I can remove the duplicated values for lens two, the ones that have duplicated genes. And I'm not sure that really it still has 37, 38. It still has 40, so it didn't eliminate any. Now, suppose 
Now suppose we want to look, we call this, uh, remember this map P we did someplace up here? Where do we do this? Map P. This is looking at the mapping function. And so where is that? That was up here. Um, Where was map P? Oh, here, yeah. This is looking at the mapping data, which is down here, which takes the probe name where the corresponding mapping is on the chromosome. Okay. And So what I'm doing is taking the at map p data, which is this data, and I'm doing a function, and I'm here I'm saying I'm doing a grep, and what does that say? What am I looking for here? Everything that starts, I'm looking for the X chromosomes. Everything that starts with a capital X, meaning it's the X chromosome. And down here I'm looking at the Y chromosomes. And so I'm looking at I'm looking at I'm looking at a grep. And if the length equals one, I'm going to I'm going to s apply this function to the map p, which means it tries to simplify it into a vector. So that's the first thing I'm going to do. And then I'm going to do the same thing for y. And then I want a table for x and y, which means they're in common. It means there are 15 in common, and most are not. So those are, the th those are the things that are in common to the X and the Y chromosomes, which you probably didn't think anything was in common, since those are the sex hormones. But in fact, that's not the case. <clears throat> so at any rate, um, so we're using a lot of things here. We're using regular expressions to search. Otherwise, it would be much harder to search these files. But this lets us easily locate a particular chromosome and subset all the things related to that chromosome. Now, you might ask, not every probe, not any probe maps to a particular chromosomal location. So you might say, well, where are those? So where are the missing? Where are the ones that are missing? So I can take this mapping function and I say, is in a is in a means of x. It means um, in a is not available, right? So, are there any in a's? So I'm going to have a missing map, and then I do a table, and it turns out there are actually 1,090 that are not mapped. To any probes that are not mapped to any particular chromosome location. Now that may be a that may be related to the way the design is done for the affymetrics. Okay. Um, now, if you look at where did I define map PS? Up? Yeah. Okay. Um, if I take map P. If you look at map P, where is it? Is this map P? Yeah. If you look, there may be one, more than one location. What this says is I only want the first. X1 means I only want the first. If there's more than one, I only want the first. So I'm going to map over it and actually just select the first location. And so I'm going to map over S apply, which gives me a vector. So I'll do that. And then I'm looking, I'm looking, um, I want to remove the missing values, if any. And then I'm going to split the PS, the names, I'm going to split the names by the map PS. And let's look at a table. And so these are the, again, the, these are um, the corresponding ones all by position.
not sure what position we're getting here. Let me look at map PS. Oh, these are all the positions here, I guess. I'm not real positive what positions are getting in this case. I know this is getting the first one. If I look here, in some cases there are two elements here. Um, I'm going to need to look at that a little bit more, what actually positions they're finding here. These are the names which correspond to these, and I'm mapping across it uniquely on this. Oh, it must be that some of these appear twice, I guess. Okay. I'll look at that a little bit more. That's actually the last thing we have here. So um, the key thing to come away from this is that if you're going to do bioinformatics, um, you may have taken a course, like we have a course on bioinformatic data analysis. That doesn't deal so much with sequences. That actually deals with gene expression data. So you actually have these probes, and affymetrics is one way you can do it. There are other probe methods, there are other ways of doing it, like uh, cDNA, for example. There are other ways of doing this that give you gene expressions, and then you analyze the expression data, and I'll tell you the types of problems you get into when you get expression data. When you get expression data, um, you may be doing it on 5,000 genes. And so if you only have cancer and non-cancer, and you're doing it on 5,000 genes, then you have 5,000 t-tests, let's say. Well, you're not going to want to use a 0.05 value for testing because that would mean you reject 5% of the time, at least if they were independent, these genes. You would reject 5% of the time. And so if you had 5,000 genes, um, well, 10% would be 500, so you'd have about 250 rejections just by chance if they were independent. So you would say, well, gee, if you're trying to narrow it, and what you, remember what you're trying to do is you're trying to find a couple genes that relate to a certain disease. And so if you, the problem you have is, A, I want to get it down to two or three genes, maybe four or five, but not 200. And B, I don't want a lot of, I don't, I don't want a lot of false positives. So you get into, you get into how, well, how do you do testing when you have 5,000 t-tests? How do I test so that my error rates are under control? Well, there are a lot of methods, and R has a lot built in. Uh, false discovery rates, uh, there are different experiment-wise error rates, so a lot of methods that have been developed, and some of these methods were developed strictly because of the bioinformatics problem, that I had so many tests that I had to control my error rates. So that course gets more into those types of topics. Here, we're actually working with sequence data. And so uh, they're both part of bioinformatics, but we actually have two different courses, you know, well, this one in the future may do more of this as we further develop this course, but the point is is that uh, we actually have another course at the 700 level that does more of this type of stuff. Um, it's a 700 level course. It's more theoretical. At any rate, so um, this is the gist of this. Uh, do we have any time, a little bit of time? Any questions on this? Okay, what I want to do now is go back into the matrix algebra a little bit. We covered last time, and so I'd like to go back and look at the notes, and I guess it's in chapter, what? Where's the matrix algebra? can't remember where I did it. I thought I did it in A. Well, it's in my other course, so I'll go there. Let's 
Someplace I have it here too. I mean, you can download it. Um, where is it? Oh, here it is. Yeah. Let me go ahead and just sort of run this. Last time we had gone through this, um, some basic uh, basic operations, matrix addition, scalar multiplication of matrices, and then I had matrix multiplication. And I gave some examples of most of these. I had transposition, taking a transpose of a matrix, matrix inverse. We did all of this last time. Subsetting matrices or submatrices. And I believe we were maybe just starting to talk about the determinant. And if I have a if I have a square matrix A, I can take the determinant of it, which is just a number. In a sense, it's a measure of the volume of the matrix. And it turns out that if I have if I matrix multiply the determinant of A times B is equal to the determinant of A times the determinant of B. Um, and it's also true that this is not what I meant. Oh, yeah. That's determinant of A prime. If I transpose a matrix, determinant of A prime is determinant of A. Determinant of C times A is C to the N times determinant of A, where A is N by N. And determinant of A is not equal to zero if A is non-singular. By non-singular, I mean you can invert it. So if I have, if I ask, if I have a matrix A, which is square, and I say, is there a matrix B such that A times B is equal to the identity matrix? If so, then B is the inverse. And I define that back here. The inverse is, a, one, is extremely important in statistics, although we usually use numerically other methods. So <clears throat> um, I went through an example here. Uh, I went through an example here on Airpol. Uh, for those of you that, how many of you know how to do regression using matrix operations? <clears throat> well, that's what I'm doing. Now, of course, I could have used just the LM function, but this actually shows you how to do it. I'll come back to that if I have a few minutes. I, I, I want to just sort of show you a few other things that are in this in this. Um, appendix or this section here. I do a little bit on, mat on vector algebra. So if I have vectors, I can do things like pick their inner product. So it's like a if I have x as a vector and y as a vector of the same length, then I can do x transpose x. It's just to sum across products of the corresponding elements of x and y. The outer product uh, takes each element multiplied of x multiplied with each element of y. So if x if x is n by 1 and y is m by 1, you end up with an n by m matrix. You can look at that and sort of figure out what it is. But we all, I also talk about some concepts here from linear algebra, particularly a little bit about vector spaces, that if I take linear combination of vectors, I get a new vector. So in this case, the s's are scalars and the a's are vectors. And for, for all combinations of s's, I, I get... I get a new vector a, and so if I look, if I have a1, a2, and so forth, and a is a linear combination, then what we call, what we say is, um, the vector space, a span, the set of all a's for all choices of s1, s2, s up to sm, where those are scalars, define a vector space of dimension, in this case, m. Well, potentially. M. And so, um, if I say, suppose I, I have a certain linear combination that equals zero. So if I have two vectors, I can have two vectors that would sum to zero, for example. Uh, well, the set of all vectors, there's a set of vectors that actually um, could actually sum to zero, and that's called the nullity. So let's consider a matrix A, and let's consider the columns a1, a2, up through am. So there's vectors. Let, let those be the columns of matrix A. 
Then we say the range of the range of the matrix is a set of all y such that y is equal to ax for some for some x. So if I take a and multiply it by x, matrix multiplication, for all possible x's, I get I get a set of y's, and that set of y's is called the range of a. The nullity is a set of all x such that ax equals zero. Uh, now what it turns out is if, if what we call the rank of a matrix is equal to the dimension of the range of a. Now that's important because you can have a matrix, you can have a data matrix that has like 100 rows, which would be the observations, and maybe 10 columns, which are the variables. Well, the fact that you have 10 variables does not mean that those variables are linearly independent of one another. And so, for example, if I, may, if I have exam 1 and exam 2, and I put a third column in, which is exam 1 plus exam 2, well, that column is dependent on the first two, and I have what's called a collinearity or a linear dependency. And so um, in statistics, we're not, usually we know when we have an exact collinearity, but what we don't know is when we have a near collinearity. We measure a bunch of variables, and someplace there's a, there's a dependency or a near dependency. That's what gets us in trouble. And that's not so obvious. There are ways you can test it, um, because if you would look at it from a numeric, if you would look at it, you would say, oh, that has full rank, and therefore I, I don't have linear dependency. But the problem is, it may be almost dependent, and if you try to fit a regression model to a bunch of predictors that are almost linearly independent, you will have a big problem. And you may not even know it although there are a lot of ways to discover you have a problem. Okay. I, um, the following are equivalent. If A is, is non-singular, that's the same as thing as saying the nullity of A is zero, or that the rank of A is N. If A, if A is N by N, uh, if it's non-singular, it means it has full rank, and that the nullity is zero. Now, another thing we often want to do is have a distance measure. And we talk about vector norms. And a lot of you are familiar with Euclidean distance. You know, you have, if you have a right angle, you have a squared plus b squared equals c squared, right? And so we want to generalize that concept to a matrix norm. But if I, if I pick p equal to 2, then I have that particular norm is the 2 norm, which corresponds to Euclidean distance if p equals 2. So this is the Euclidean norm, where I'm measuring distance according to the normal way you think about geometry. But if you were in New York City, and you're standing in this block, and you're at one building on one corner, and you want to go to the building on the other corner, unless you can fly, the distance the Euclidean distance, meaning walking through that city block, is of no importance to you because the way you have to get there is to walk along one block and then up another block, right? That's called the city block distance, and that's the equivalent to this norm where you take the, add the absolute values of the components, and that's called the city block norm. The, another common one is the maximum component, called the maximum norm. Um, and again, in statistics, all three of those norms are very commonly used. So for example, if you were fitting a regression model, and you've got a bunch of x's in your model, um, there are, the, you've got to be careful if you fit things where you have collinearity. So often in genomic experiments, um, you may have some serious problems with collinearity. And so if you're doing this, then we, ne we need to be careful that uh, we throw away everything that's collinear. And it turns out that there are a lot of methods called regularization methods, such as the lasso, that lets you, uh, that lets you um, fit models where you have collinearity in these high-dimensional spaces. But again, the other, the other topic here, and I'm just going to mention this, is matrix decompositions, and I have quite a few of them here. Um, the QI decomposition is the basis of linear models. 
Um, and by linear models, I mean the analysis of variance, analysis of covariance, multiple regression, things like that. All of those models are linear models. But even, even generalized linear models will use these techniques, even though there's a nonlinear component to the linear models. So at any rate, uh, the LU decomposition is another method of solving linear equations. Singular value decomposition is perhaps the most important matrix decomposition in statistics. I'll explain why next time. Eigenvalue decomposition and so forth. Square root decompositions. Uh, so I have a number of decompositions here which you can take a look at. You should really know those. So we'll stop. <laughs>